Welcome everyone to another episode of Signs, Plants, and Stellar Rhythms. My name is Eric Roth, uh, shamanic astrologer, and I will be guiding you through this uh, new video uh, about the astrology of Mars and Venus, shamanic astrology of Mars and Venus and Leo, plus some more major astrological insights for this period of late June 2021 through mid-July. And I'm only highlighting a few of the the big ones. Some other ones, of course, you know, we could talk just about, especially around the moon, we could talk about all kinds of things that are going on. But I want to really focus on a few of the, the important ones that are coming up for all of us and uh, giving some insight and some guidance around how to navigate this. All right, uh, let's commence with uh, number 22. What I'd like to start off with is just an acknowledgement and a vocation, honoring the stars and the planets and all our relations and creation itself, which includes Gaia, our Mother Earth, four directions and all of the elements, all of the planets and asteroids, and all of our relations. This is uh, connecting into that environment, connecting into what we have a relationship with, with all of that this feeling is we are part of the cosmic creation itself. No matter what is going on in the world, this is always taking place. Just wanna say thank you and be in gratitude for uh, being in a relationship for their guidance and their wisdom and their love. Okay, the highlights of episode 22, we have five, major things. And one of them I'm gonna spend a little bit more time on than the others. And that would be the, the title of this episode, the Mars and Venus together in the sign of Leo. But at the same time that that's going on, Saturn is in Aquarius opposite Venus and Mars. And so I have a slide put together just for that, specifically to kind of share with you a little bit of insight into that. Then we have in this period of time, late June into through mid-July, we have Neptune and Chiron both stationing retrograde. And I'm gonna review what that looks like on the natal chart of the United States. And then um, also in early July, we have the earth reaching its aphelion point. And I'll describe what that means as we move forward into this um, video. Okay. So let's start off because this is the first one that's taking place um, in, uh, on the, calendrically speaking. Uh, Mars has already moved into Leo at, at the time of this recording of the video. But since Venus and Mars don't get together until about mid-July, uh, I put that sort of in the center of this uh, topic here uh, for this episode 22. So on June 25th, Neptune makes its annual station retrograde. Uh, this year, um, 23 degrees, 11 minutes of Pisces. Neptune moves about roughly a little over two degrees per year and about where a little over two degrees from where it stationed retrograde back in 2020. The steady pace that takes about 13 to 14 years to transit one full sign of the zodiac. This retrograde period from June 25th will end on December 1st in at 20 degrees, 24 minutes Pisces. So that's the entire retrograde loop. Um, in shamanic astrology, uh, Neptune represents a more mystical connection to the upper or celestial realm or, or world. It is a plan that symbolizes dreams, formlessness, and nonlinear time. It can act as a dissolving agent to our attachments and hold of reality. Uh, Neptune has been in the sign of Pisces since 2011. Uh, for about four months, it was then, and then it fully moved into uh, the sign of Pisces in 12, 2012. It has been there ever since and will continue to be in there until uh, 2025 when it begins its transition to the sign of Aries. So Neptune is a planet that uh, really can create, um, for those especially that are, are really uh, much more attached to third dimension and our goal setters and, and, and really focused in on a sort of an ambitious kind of quality to them. 
when Neptune comes into the picture, it can act, it can dissolve things. It can, it can send things into sort of a transitory state of existence. It's kind of, a, uh, again, a nonlinear situation where it's not a good time to, to plan things or to uh, set any goals or, you know, uh, have especially, I would not want to stress this, uh, set expectations about what could occur. Because it's a Neptune's kind of a field of all probabilities or possibilities, and uh, tends things tend to drift in and out of existence in that sense, kind of like a, a mirage type of energy. Um, oh, obviously, it's not the only planet that's acting out there. It's not the only planet that's, you know, providing this um, symbolic um, uh, language for us to navigate, uh, but it does provide some additional insights into certain certain times when it might be transiting, say on a personal chart. If you're certainly, if you have uh, personal planets between uh, roughly the 20, 20 to 23 degree range, um, you know, this around the signs of Pi and the signs of Pisces, Sagittarius, Gemini and Virgo, uh, this you're in a Neptune cycle. You're, you're in that in that space. Next year, it's gonna get up to around 25 degrees uh, Pisces, so in 2022. So that's something to uh, be aware of in your own um, uh, life journey. Well, it's gonna take a look at something that's connecting us here, at least here in the United States and its influence in the world, um, Neptune in the US's chart. Okay, there's a, Right now going on, there is a uh, Neptune opposition uh, transit taking place in, for the US. And this is happening concurrently with a Pluto return initiation, something I've talked about in previous videos, although I haven't uh, done a full video on the Pluto return initiation, which uh, I suspect is coming soon. I just transitioned myself actually into uh, an apartment here in Medford, Oregon from another place that I was living in temporarily in the Rogue Valley. So um, I'm kind of getting things going again, setting up things. And um, there's a lot on the docket for that, but that's, that's one video I definitely have my eye on uh, creating this summer. So along with the Pluto return initiation, the US is experiencing a Neptune opposition initiation. Uh, officially this transit began March 31st, 2021 and will end on January 25th. 2023, but like all cycles, initiations, especially from a shamanic perspective, it isn't just the mathematical one degree orb that we look at, but it's, it can go beyond that, but that say, whether it be a community, uh, an individual or uh, a nation can experience the, tran uh, especially major significant transits like this can experience in them, uh, can experience them sometimes weeks or, or a few months ahead of time. So we certainly can experience in our own lives, especially those that are here in the US and looking at it, the, um, uh, the strange and bizarreness of, of what's taking place and the reactions of the populace and the contentions that are going on. Uh, it, it is definitely a land of confusion and Neptune's signature is on it. Not the only one, but it definitely is acting in concert with these other uh, planetary initiators. The Pluto return is taking place that began in 2020. Uh, didn't really get into one degree orb until 2021 this year, but I look at it as starting 2020 due to the uh, significant uh, alignment of planets, Saturn, uh, Jupiter, and Pluto coming together in the sign of Capricorn in 2020. So Pluto return uh, briefly is highlighted by a uh, chrysalis death rebirth stage for uh, really a nation, uh, obviously individuals can't get there because it takes 248 years, 245 years to get to uh, a, a Pluto return cycle. Um, and I, I've got about a four to five year period uh, of this uh, due, to, due to the significance of this and how uh, profound it is for anything to experience a Pluto return. But Neptune, on the other hand, tends to dissolve the national grasp of reality, national goals, stances, priority systems. It can also be a vehicle for a spiritual crisis and confusion at the same time. 
that it can be heart opening. So, and we see this a lot here in the U.S. It's, it is definitely where we are uh, in an identity crisis of sorts. Um, there's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, in, in rooted into the spiritual crisis, a lot of confusion, a lot of, um, uh, also a lot of heart opening and people coming together and seeing each other as, as one people. That's kind of a, a boundless, formless, limitless um, signature of what Neptune can bring in. And so that, that general mix can create a lot of uh, a strange uh, interaction uh, between the groups of, of people and its relationship with uh, their own spiritual path and uh, religion and uh, the communities they interact with. Neptune can also dislodge our sense of time, operating outside what we perceive as cause and effect. And it's a nebulous dreamlike experience. So for those that are attached to that, you know, hard reality and goals, and, and if they, uh, you know, being operating here in the U.S., we're just by default, all of us are experiencing some level of Neptunian-ness uh, in this, uh, at this time. And you can see here, uh, we've got the natal chart of the U.S. here in the center. Uh, the natal position of Neptune is 22, 25 degrees Virgo. And as of this recording, Neptune is right now here in late, uh, just after the solstice, the June solstice, Neptune's at um, 23 degrees, 11 minutes in um, uh, Pisces. So we can see that this is the opposition. We can also see that Neptune's also at the same time, it's squaring uh, the natal chart of the US and its natal Mars position, which is adding to that, uh, our own personal experience with you know, defining what is our, our masculinity, um, going through a certain level of, of, in some cases, dysfunction and uh, rebellion against um, others that may have a more open view of what, what masculine is. Um, and so that's part of the, uh, again, that's part of what's going on underneath all of this. What's also coming up beyond the Neptune opposition on July 5th is, uh, a process called aphelion. So the earth and all planets essentially don't have a perfectly circular orbit. And so there's a point where it reaches its farthest point from the sun in its orbit and its closest point to the sun in its orbit. So its farthest point from the sun is, is about two weeks after the June solstice and where the sun is gonna be about at 13 to 14 degrees of cancer in the twins constellation. It's actually a pretty interesting uh, point where the sun is in the sky. It's, it's right there with the stars of Castor and Pollux and the twins representing a really powerful, um, our own powerful connection to dua our duality of our universe, our cosmos, our world. Um, so it really symbolizes that and emphasizes that and it's passage during this time. This happens every single year. Um, and that to coincide with the farthest point, and, we, and that's also a duality, farthest and closest, um, is, is pretty intriguing to me. And this isn't always the case, but it can take uh, uh, you know, many centuries uh, to uh, evolve where the point shifts uh, to uh, a different point um, uh, in the zodiac, it drifts, just like the uh, procession of the equinox. So I believe it's uh, like, um, one day every uh, 58 years, uh, I, may, I may have to look that up again, but it shows on timeanddate.com and, and it's a great resource for this kind of information um, that shows that information more clearly um, and more, more detailed. So there's a, a 3 million mile or 5 million kilometer dif difference between the closest point that the earth has with the sun and the farthest point that the earth has with the sun. So in July, it's at its farthest and in early January, usually on the first or second of January, it's at its um, uh, closest point to the sun. And um, during that time is when, um, you know, the earth is uh, in January, the earth is tilted, the south is tilted towards the sun and the north is tilted away and it's the opposite in um, June and July. Okay, so what do we 
our, our next point here of what we got is Mars and Venus in Leo. Well, right now, Mars and Venus in Leo are easily visible in the early evening sky, and especially Venus being very bright, and Mars right now is uh, really uh, continuing to dim a little bit more um, over these next two months before it reaches a point where it uh, disappears in the glare of the sun. Um, but on July 13th, they come together for the first time since 2017. So this is a really uh, sort of important stage of this um, continuing evolution of the masculine or feminine in the world. Uh, Mars has been in Leo since June 11th and continues through Leo until July 29th. Venus in Leo from June 26th until July 21st. And this is, it's, the conjunction happens in a place that is between the crab and the lion constellation. So it's kind of in this space between the stars. Um, what the, uh, the Greeks kind of referred to the as unformed stars. Uh, Dan Jumara talks about this um, in, when he talks about the night sky and, and between constellations, space between constellations. So uh, being the sign of, and then being the sign of Leo doesn't mean it's in the sign or the constellation of the lion. It actually doesn't actually get into the lion or the lion constellation until roughly around, um, uh, just after this point of, of July 13th. Um, and then by um, uh, the time it gets, when Mars reaches um, Regulus on July 29th and 30th, it actually reaches the sign of Virgo, which is marked by the star at zero degrees Virgo. And same thing with Venus on July 21st and 22nd, it'll be right there with, um, with the star Regulus. So again, this is an early evening time. And I went out um, just actually the night before this recording, went out and took a look at uh, Mars and Venus and they are definitely uh, drawing closer and closer together. And Venus, since it's a faster moving planet is uh, rapidly gaining, um, uh, catching up to that, uh, that red planet that we know as Mars. Okay, so um, again, this is, as I mentioned before, this is gonna be the first visible conjunction that we've seen since the fall or autumn of 2017. That would be, of course, spring in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, and this conjunction takes place at 19 degrees, 48 minutes of Leo. Uh, the two planets are within 10 degrees of each other all of July, uh, but beginning uh, uh, as soon as July, sorry, as soon as June 26th in the early west northwestern sky. So they're, from a shamanic perspective, they're conjunct in that whole time. So when you, uh, one way to know about a 10 degree orb uh, from just, a, a, from a rough estimate, one can just extend their arm out into the sky with a closed hand or a fist. And from uh, one edge of that to the other edge, you have approximately 10 degrees of or or of movement of from a uh, planetary body that moves across the sky or anything that moves across the sky is about 10 degrees. And so you'll see that Mars and Venus are gonna be dancing together in the evening sky for all of July and uh, beginning at the end of June, end of June. So the waxing crescent moon is in conjunction with the two planets on July 12th. So that'll be actually a really good um, way for those that are uh, unfamiliar with the sky, the night sky especially, to understand where, um, uh, where Mars and Venus are. Because when we have the waxing crescent moon nearby, um, you can really, you know, you can see what, li what little lights are or along uh, that path. And Venus is like that second hand on the clock. It can show you, can point out where things are fairly rapidly every single month. And that'll give you a great indicator of, of tuning into the night sky. So what does it mean for Mars and Venus to be together? Well, um, this is a potent co connection in the sign of Leo. It activates a radical radiant self-love and creator matrix and alchemy of both the masculine and feminine principles. An intent of right use of creative will and leadership to shine light on the shadow or to shine light really upon everything. 
shadows is kind of a, a connection to what's what we have buried, what we might not be consciously aware of. And uh, we've, de we've definitely gotten a huge amount of that from Pluto's um, uh, process, uh, its transit through Capricorn, and it's, it started in 2020, and how that helped um, uh, show us more consciously uh, what is underlying uh, the fabric of, of our structure, uh, economic, political, uh, educational health systems. Uh, so Leo is a way to help kind of beam into that area more fully and show us more, um, more of the creative side, more of this sort of this vibrancy that, you know, that we all can shine in, in amongst ourselves as human beings here on this planet. It also brings out these archetypes of the queen and king and their interconnected mysteries with the land. So there is something intimate happening there um, with Leo and the land and the, uh, the more ancient uh, way of looking at um, a, a sort of sovereign royal person in how they are, their rise and fall uh, in a sense is interconnected with, the, with its people and the land that it inhabits. So there is something really, I think, uh, potently magical that is going on right there. Uh, Leo is an extroverted force of fire that is up and out and desires to simply be through inspiration and becoming the vision carrier. So there is this uh, sense of, of not an escape, but uh, a revelation, uh, a certain amount of a spark that can come through here through that inspiration and maybe leadership from the masculine the feminine, at least a, an intent for that that can come from this um, this dance of Mars and Venus here. Now, on on a deeper level, Mars, of course, is beginning to dim more and more, and is the masculine is sort of fading into the glare of the sun over these next few months. But Venus, on the other hand, is going the opposite. It's actually opening up more, brightening up. And uh, when you see Venus and Mars together, you can see uh, vastly different um, uh, light and brightness, uh, magnitude of these, um, of these two planets. And in that, in that sense, um, it doesn't mean that the masculine is, is, is gonna fade from existence. It's more about the masculine about to go through uh, its own transition, its own death and rebirth uh, in the late summer and into uh, by, uh, I think, ending about mid-fall um, in November. So it's about a three month, three month process. Meanwhile, Venus, again, is going to continue to brighten and brighten until it reaches its um, you know, maximum magnitude in, in the evening time uh, later on this year. While all of that is happening, we see Saturn in opposition to Mars and Venus. Saturn's in Aquarius, and it has uh, an exact opposition with Mars on July 1st, and uh, exact opposition with Venus on July 6th at 12 degrees Aquarius, both of them roughly around 12 degrees, and where you know, Mars and Venus are Leo, Saturn and Aquarius. But they're in the, each of these two inner planets, Mars and Venus are within a 10 degree orb, of this opposition, this polarity with Saturn. For Mars, it's from June 16th through July 15th. And for Venus, it's from July 1st through Ju July 14th. As you can see, Mars moves a lot slower. So it doesn't, um, it has, uh, spends a little more time in that uh, 10 degree orbit of opposition with Saturn. So what does Saturn create? So it adds an element of growth to limits and boundaries the masculine and feminine Leo archetypal expressions. And this can be both helpful to Leo's creative vision in bringing that vision into reality. And at the same time can be hindering in a way, depending on one's perception of this at times, because it requires a certain amount of work to make that vision take shape. Um, and we can also add in the Aquarius portion of this so that there's a certain level of innovation and inventiveness that can come through this process that is uh, in direct line between Aquarius and Leo. So this can be a, a sort of an unusual uh, period of time um, just to after this uh, Saturn-Uranus 
um, square that took place recently. And Uranus is still in the picture here. I'm not excluding that in the description uh, here necessarily, but I was ma making this a little more simplified. However, Uranus uh, could present some uh, additional unexpected and unpredictable uh, results and or breakthroughs that could take place during this time as well. All right, this moves us to Chiron. And um, we have Chiron station retrograde July 15th. And this Chiron represents a fracture point or soul wound of an individual in shamanic astrology. Mythologically, Chiron is a shaman centaur, a maverick teacher and healer that was revered a few millennia ago, especially during the time when they, a particular constellation is not so readily visible now in, in the um, mid-northern hemisphere called Centaurus, uh, which was at that time much more visible in the, in the mid-latitudes and, you know, 30 uh, 35 degrees and up and, and below that, especially in its fullness and Asia Minor and the early Mediterranean cultures, uh, Mesopotamia, Egypt, and the Southern, uh, Southern European uh, cultures. Astronomically, Chiron is a class of planetary bodies known as centaurs that mainly orbit uh, uh, between uh, Saturn and out to the orbit of Uranus. So past the orbit of uh, Saturn and out to the orbit of Uranus. And Chiron was the first and one of the largest ones that has been discovered. Currently, it is in the sign of Aries and stations retrograde July 15th, as mentioned, at 1255 of that sign. So almost 13 degrees Aries. It transitioned into the sign of Aries uh, from Pisces in 2018 to 2019 and will remain in Aries uh, until it transitions into Taurus, 2026 and 2027. And um, Chiron is in the slowest part of its orbit right now. When it's at the fastest part, it can actually move through a sign in two to three years. And so at the slowest part, being in uh, Pisces, Aries, and Taurus, um, it's gonna take a while. And so for those that are having that have uh, um, personal planets or points in Aries, Capricorn, Libra, and Cancer in this middle degree area, late early to middle degree from you know the eight degrees to roughly uh, 14 degrees, you know, you're either in a cycle or you're about to begin a, a Chiron cycle. All right, so further elaborating this, and this is really interesting because I mentioned about Pluto and especially Neptune and how the US is, is going through these transitions or these transits. Well, um, we are in the early stages of a Chiron, uh, a pre-Chiron return as Chiron right now is squaring the uh, natal sun position of the, of the US. Um, and I, I just got a recently from, um, uh, a, a, an email from Dan and Mario that passed on from an astrologer, Greg Nell, and he did some research around Chiron returns here in the United States and how uh, they've created a certain opportunities for the U.S. Uh, and its wounds um, and uh, its fracture points since its creation. Um, so that's, that's worth further uh, study for on myself. And I will uh, I'll mention that research again at a later time when I, I dive a little bit farther into it. Uh, but for now, um, the um, uh, describe Aries, and I, as I've described it before with uh, videos about Mars and a little bit about Chiron and Eris as well. Uh, this is a time where, uh, where the, for the fracture point of, of, of the US is gonna be coming out more and more and especially in the many wars and rebellions and other battles that were taking place in the US and it's around the world that involved uh, America. You know, these scars have taken uh, a big toll um, since, the, since its founding. And in a couple of years, it'll, we'll experience the Chiron return and there'll be a lot of overlap with, a, with the Pluto return. Um, so in that sense, there'll be both strong underworld uh, currents coming through in that, in that space. Um, so we're just experiencing kind of a preview of that. But I look at this a little bit more, hopefully, in that uh, we have an opportunity here to really 
gather the medicine that we need to really look at that more fully and to to really own our vulnerability own up to our vulnerabilities to own up to uh, our shadow our unconscious self own up to what our soul's direction is Chiron is giving us that that great opportunity to go into that space um, and part of that is in uh, race relations social strife uh, a lot of the um, uh, ideals of equality um, the founding of this purpose and the scars, of course, and how we uh, generate that is our, our mission and manifest destiny upon this planet. Uh, at one time it was, and is it still, or what have we moved into here as, as, as a nation? So it's looking at that more fully and, and hopefully with greater a sense of, of opening up to the necessary grief that needs to take place. Uh, the necessary ownership of that, you know, of our feelings around that, uh, and especially in combination with the Buddha return. So we can connect more and more into that for ourselves. Um, a Chiron uh, stays retrograde until it um, stations direct on December 19th, 2021 at eight degrees and 26 minutes. Uh, so, okay. Uh, oh, and I just want to, one more thing to point out about the Chiron uh, cycle in the, uh, the US is Chiron squaring uh, the sun in Cancer. So this is a Cancer mean um, sort of a, a welcoming, nurturing uh, one tribe, one family type of, uh, at least the on an ideal level. But unfortunately it can be uh, something I wrote about in the summer solstice, the June solstice article is that they could, it could lead to a sense of more of a, a nationalistic energy or isolationist energy where it's just like a locked in of this, you know, sort of the toxic version of tribalism. Um, so that we've seen that come out uh, quite a bit in the last several years. And um, we've seen it other times in, in human history. And even right now across the world, there are other uh, nations out there um, that are experiencing that as well. So maybe this is a way for us to uh, to open up to to more of a of a of a global level of understanding of what it means to be human rather than just uh, you know a national identity. Thank you for uh, being part of this. Thank you for watching this. Um, please definitely share and like it if if you look, if you do. And um, uh, I. I'm a shamanic astrologist, so I do personal astrology readings, classes, and events, uh, and astro cartography. Uh, my website is farallexis.com. And uh, of course, this material is based upon uh, the shamanic astrology paradigm from Daniel to Mario. And you can learn more about that as well at shamanicastrology.com. And there are online courses available to take there. Uh, I will be um, doing some traveling this uh, coming summer. Uh, 2021 and into the early fall as well. Um, so things are just starting to kind of open up in the in the world a bit more, uh, especially here in the U.S. So I'm going to be uh, doing some fairs and uh, other things and readings in person that I'm uh, excited about and uh, kind of resuming my uh, practice in a you know sort of a rebirth way, like many out there uh, that are healers and or uh, you know, rejoining the world, so to speak. Um, so I look forward to, to sharing more and I wish you all the best and dream well out there.